And it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Helen Papaganis, who's been here. Have you been here? Were you here our first year, Helen? I was, for sure, yeah. yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm, I was screaming too loudly when Ori asked who was excited this morning. Okay. Yeah, okay. Is it sound, the sound good? Well, they'll adjust it at the back. And um, really, I mean, Helen is a thought leader in the field of augmented reality. She was named one of the top 100 um, most important people in digital media in 2013. And awesome speaker, so let's just get on with it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, this is my four fourth year, actually, at, um, at AWE. And it's an extra special year for me because um, last Friday, I defended my PhD dissertation, and it's all done, so I'm no longer a graduate student. Um, so I'm really, really excited, thank you. Um, so for those of you who follow me on Twitter, um, you know that I have some pretty interesting conversations with customs agents. And the past nine years has been a little something like this. And in the past year or so, I've noticed a shift, and it's become more like this, to which I reply, yeah, kind of, sort of, that's what I do. And for me, these conversations with customs agents have been a barometer for augmented reality entering the public consciousness. So, you know, we are really expanding as an industry, as a community, and as a medium. And so when I'm asked, well, what is my, my PhD dissertation about? I say, it's all about you. And doubly so, because it is all about you guys. It is about us as an industry and as a community, but it's also about the individual. So for me, the new augmented reality is all about creating a personalized custom experience like we heard Robert this morning talking about in the keynote. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So for me, the larger work has been about, um, and I'm sure you just heard the Canadian accent there about, um, documenting augmented reality as a new medium, as a new terrain. And so bringing into you know, to play things like storytelling. When I began the work nine years ago, it was all about storytelling. And I'm, I'm very excited to hear um, people talk about storytelling uh, today and, and it being a really important aspect of, of content. And so part of the work has been tracing the evolution of the augmented reality experience. So looking at things like the magic mirror to then moving to um, our bodies becoming markers with the Kinect to looking glass devices like the iPad and the iPhone. And um, the image there with the spider was a book that I presented here, I think it was in 2011 at AWE. And it was the, the first augmented reality book designed for iPads. So if you're interested in that project, it's online at um, augmentedstories.com. You can see some documentation. And then lastly, of course, the move to, um, to eyewear, which I'm sure we'll hear some spectacular things um, from Meta, who are up next. And so for me, this is a really, really, really important slide. Um, my project and your project and all of our work collectively has really been about this. It's been about going where there is no path and leaving a trail. And with this, of course, you know, comes huge responsibility. So we have a lot of important work to do. You know, I'm, I'm really, really flattered and honored to be on stage after the great Ronald Azuma. Um, it was 17 years ago, like 17 years ago, that he wrote the seminal paper, A Survey of Augmented Reality, which um, Trish said, you know, really kind of has defined augmented reality as we know it today. And so these three technical characteristics, of course, that we all know, combines the real and the virtual, interactive in real time, and is registered in 3D. And I'd like to propose that, you know, we collectively revisit this definition um, as an industry and as a community. And one thing for me that I'd really like to add and you know, after hearing, of course, Robert's keynote this morning, is context. Because in my research, one of the things that I've looked at um, that distinguishes augmented reality as a new medium is context. So the other place that we're at currently is that we really do need to move beyond augmented reality being just about computer vision. And so in 2011, at the ISMAR conference in Switzerland, Adrian Schiock, gave a really fantastic um, keynote where he said just this. He said, you know, Ismar is placing too much emphasis on the tracking competition, right? That we're forgetting about all the other senses and making augmented reality really interactive. And I see Christopher Stapleton in the crowd, so I have to give a big shout out. Chris was really instrumental in bringing the arts, media, and humanities to Ismar, um, not as an, in, uh, as an addition, but as an integral part. And, you know, that's still happening today, and it's, it's really, really important that we're doing that. So for me, it's, it's not about forgetting about computer vision. Computer vision is absolutely still integral and important, 
but for me, what I'm seeing, and I'm sure all of you are also witnessing, is that there's this shift happening in augmented reality where we're moving away from a technology and into an experience. And part of my, um, part of my research has looked at documenting augmented reality and how it's been evolving as a medium. And so there are two words that I'd like to add to the lexicon. And so I've determined that, you know, kind of in what I've seen over the past, it's been nine years for me that I've been working with the medium, is that we've seen um, two waves, and they are overlay and entryway. And overlay is just like it sounds. It's pretty much how we know augmented reality today, as an overlay of digital data on top of the real world. Now, the second wave that I'm very excited about is entryway. And what I mean by entryway is things like context really coming into play, um, creating a much more interactive, immersive experience, an interactive world, as Ori talked about this morning. And as we enter this entryway, um, the definition of augmented reality starts to expand to include things like sensors, wearable computing, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and of course, not abandoning the other senses to create a really um, meaningful and contextual and memorable experience. This is a really important quote for me, and I think for all of us as a community. Um, Nicholas Negroponte said, computing is not about computers anymore, it's about living. And the same, I think, applies to augmented reality. It's not just about computer vision anymore, it's about living in the real world. Um, what was it that Ori said this morning? Um, human world interface, I think it was, right? So it's all about living and having that experience in reality. Um, ten years ago, some of you may know this project, um, I worked at Bruce Mao Design leading a project called Massive Change, the Future of Global Design. And our kind of tagline was that massive change is not about the world of design, it's about the design of the world. And the book that I'm working on right now is called The 40 Ideas That Will Change Reality. So you've noticed that I've dropped augmented because I do believe this will happen. It will just be reality. And in many ways, this book is an extension of massive change. And it's looking to inspire kind of a new generation of designers and technologists and end users um, and how we will come to interact with augmented reality and just reality on a daily basis. So I'm, I'm collaborating right now with Bruce Mao, who I worked on um, uh, with massive change, and so we're looking at, you know, beyond the book, what is the interface, what else is it, and we're looking at things like an exhibition. Um, so I, I'm interested, if you'd love to, ch you know, I'd love to chat with you a bit more about that afterwards. So I thought I'd get into three of the 40 ideas that will change reality. Now, those of you who know me know that it wouldn't be a Helen Papagenis presentation if I didn't include the banana phone. So I don't know how many of you have seen this video. Um, I won't show the video in the interest of time, but it's called Invoke Computing, and it's from researchers at the um, University of Tokyo. And basically, it's an on-demand experience. So you need to use a phone. You pick up a banana. It's a phone. Um, you need to send an important email. There's a pizza box there, the laptop. It, the pizza box becomes a laptop. So context really comes into play here, where objects in the real world are now on demand. They become augmented as we need them. So it becomes this um, highly kind of personalized experience based on your needs, and it's anticipatory. The second idea that will change reality is cognizant computing. So this uh, is where you know, context and things like um, what Robert was talking about this morning um, kind of these kind of curated experiences, things that are uniquely tailored to you really come into play. Dr. Genevieve Bell from Intel, she's a fantastic, fantastic researcher, anthropologist. Um, and so she talks about how we will enter these reciprocal relationships with our devices, where our devices will come to know us very well and anticipate our needs and begin to act on our behalf. I'm sure most of you have seen the film, um, Her. So, you know, we may just have these personal OSs. I don't know if we will fall in love with them necessarily, but um, this is, you know, cognizant computing is, is all about creating these custom experiences. And the last um, idea of the 40 is Calm Technology, which I suspect this year will be, um, will come up quite a bit. And so this is the late uh, Mark Weiser. And he said, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. 
And this was 24 years ago, or 23. And so in those two waves that I mentioned, overlay and entryway, in the first wave, we really tried to make the invisible visible. Now, the second wave that we're entering, we want to make the visible invisible. So we're flipping this with technology then receding into the background and the human experience is what is at the center and what is you know, absolutely key. So as I mentioned, nine years ago, I began really kind of looking at storytelling and augmented reality. And this, um, this is still true for me. It's just now it's becoming a different kind of story. It's becoming a story of you. And as we're entering this next wave of entryway, you know, we have a whole new bag of possibilities of what, you know, what does a story look like? What does it mean when it's customized and based on your context? And so the story is about you and you and you and you and you. And over the next two days, I hope that, you know, we continue to have these um, kind of, you know, awe-inspiring conversations and presentations and, you know, really look at what is the future of augmented reality because it is, of course, ours to define. So thank you so much. Um, I'm around to chat for the next couple of days. I'd love to talk to you. And I think I'm out of time, right? Or? Yeah. Okay. But we do, we do have time for a couple of questions again while we do the changeover. So if you have a question for Helen, uh, I think we've got a mic for you somewhere. If I can see. Uh, yes. And mic. Yes. Oh, Chris. Hi. There's a lot of inventions out here. I'm really interested in innovation. Um, and what is the role of the artist with innovation? You being artist in innovation. The role of the artist is absolutely critical. It's really important to... Um, Golan Levin wrote a really important paper um, where he said, you know, artists need to be involved early on in new technologies and innovative processes. Um, so for me, those of you who don't know, my background is originally in the fine arts. So I'm trained um, traditionally as a fine artist, but I've grown up with technology and I, I went the other, um, the other side of it too. So maybe creative technologists, I don't know. But look, um, artists, artists are the dreamers, they're the imaginists, right? And so it's very important that, um, usually in all my talks I say that you know, these, the artists and the technologists have to have these conversations, right? It can't be you know, something that the artists come in at the end and give some kind of aesthetic flavor and aesthetic quality to. It has to be something that, you know, early on they're involved in that brainstorming process, in that experimentation, in that tinkering. And just, is there another question I can't see very well? Oh, there we go. Over here, sorry. Uh, can you give an example of uh, such... Sorry, where are you? Hi. Hey, uh, uh, can you give an example of uh, a technology you have helped framing as an artist and like how you changed it? Um, so throughout the course of my PhD, um, I was at uh, York University. And York University in Toronto had a phenomenal, and they still have rather than had, um, has a phenomenal lab that is based in the Faculty of Fine Arts and Department of Film. So when I began working with augmented reality nine years ago, I didn't have any tools. So, I mean, I did another uh, post-grad in interactive multimedia, and so, I mean, I learned basic programming. But when I started working with augmented reality, there were no tools for artists, right? And so what I began to do is I would take demos and hack them and try to break them and understand how they worked, and then insert my own content into them. So the work that I began doing on my own um, then came to influence the tools that the lab developed. So they developed um, a drag-and-drop augmented reality software called uh, Snapdragon. So that's still available today. Um, it's for non-programmers and you know, people who are interested in AR but just yeah, don't have that background. So that's one example. Thank you. We're, um, we're going to move on 